Hey everybody, this is Russ from Metro Game Core. Today we're going to take a look at the iNeo Pocket Air. Now, iNeo is a company known for making handheld PCs, but this is their very first Android based device. And I think it's going to be interesting to see all the lessons they've learned when it comes to Windows machines and how that translates over into this Android device here. Now, in terms of chipset, this is not top of the line. It's a Dimensity D1200. That's still a pretty good chipset. It's going to be able to play all of the systems that you can play on Android, but I think the other draws are going to be other components. For example, the AMOLED display that we have here, a really big battery, which will give us nice battery life, and then also some pretty decent controls. So in this video, what I want to do is take a look at all the different hardware and software components to determine whether or not that $300 starting price is going to be a good match for you. And so without any further delay, let's go ahead and get started. Okay, as always, we're going to start with the specs. For the CPU, we have a Dimensity 1200. That's an 8-core processor. And in terms of RAM, we have three different options, 6, 8, or 12 gigabytes. And it's a similar story with the internal storage. We have 128, 256, and 512 gigabyte options. And the device I'm reviewing today has 8 gigabytes of RAM and 256 gigs of storage. For the display, we have a 5.5 inch AMOLED panel with 1080p resolution and a 16 by 9 aspect ratio. We also have an impressively big battery at 7350 milliamp hours. And on average, I've gotten about 8 hours of gameplay on a single charge in my testing. For connectivity, we have DisplayPort 1.4, which is capable of video out. In addition, we have Wi-Fi 6, Bluetooth 5.2, as well as 4G LTE. The system is Android 12, and we've got a couple other perks, including a fingerprint sensor and a microSD card slot. Now, if you're not familiar with the Dimensity 1200 chipset, I would say that the closest equivalent is the Snapdragon 865. They both have eight cores, and in terms of benchmark performance, they're about neck and neck. And we'll do a little bit more chipset comparison between these two later in the video. Now, the Pocket Air is currently up for pre-order on their Indiegogo campaign. And as of making this video, there's about two weeks left. Now, let's take a look at their pricing chart, starting with the low-spec model at the Indiegogo price of $299. Now, if you'd like, you can bump up that RAM and storage and go all the way up to $460. And when it goes to full retail, you can see the prices increase quite a bit more. Now, one of the common questions are whether or not you need additional RAM and storage. And I think the storage question is a pretty easy answer in the fact that we have a micro SD card slot so you can always expand your storage if you'd like. However, when it comes to RAM, it's not quite as cut and dry. I think that 6 gigabytes will probably do pretty well for most emulation. When you increase the RAM, it usually only has two main benefits when it comes to Android-based gaming. Number one is going to be Nintendo Switch emulation, but as you'll see later in this video, this isn't a great chipset for that anyway. And the other benefit will be high-end Android gaming. So if you want to play something competitive like PUBG or Call of Duty and have better graphics, then having that additional RAM might help. However, when it comes to straight emulation, which is what we're going to cover through the majority of this video, the 299 6GB model will be just fine. Okay, so now let's move over to the unboxing. I actually really like the box that they're using here. It definitely has a nice retro vibe. And from an unboxing perspective, it's actually a pretty simple process. A lot of the other iNeo devices have some unnecessarily elaborate packaging. Anyway, inside the box, we are going to find a USB-C charging cable. And other than that, we just have a couple instruction manuals that'll walk you through the hardware and software of this device. So let's take a quick look at it. And first impressions, I actually really like the coloring. I'm not completely sold on the off-color joysticks, but I do like the cream color of the device itself and those red accents. And I also like the fact that they have this big, bold logo here on the back. It just makes it feel even more retro. Let's go ahead and take a look at the controls, starting with the analog sticks. Now, these are very much in line with the analog sticks that you can find on a Nintendo Switch Joy-Con. But there are some key differences. Number one, these are using magnetic hull sensors, which means they won't develop stick drift over time. The grip is also more textured, which means it's going to stick pretty easily to your thumb. Now, within the GamePad Tester app, you can see that we have nearly a full range of motion. And there's no cardinal snapping here, which means that I can freely move around in any of these quadrants. I did notice that we're not getting a full range of motion at some of the very top corners, but that didn't affect my actual gameplay. So other than the fact that the analog sticks themselves are relatively small, I have no complaints about the actual controls themselves. These also stick out quite a bit from the actual case itself, which is going to make it a little bit less pocketable, but a lot more ergonomic. So other than the fact that they're just a little bit small for my taste, I don't really have any complaints about these analog sticks. Next up, let's try the D-pad. This has a rubber membrane connection, which is going to have a classic retro feel. And this is very similar to the other iNeo Air devices in that regard. However, for this model in particular, it does feel like the rubber membrane's a little bit softer and looser than I remember. 
However, I want to test it while actually in game. Let's start with the Street Fighter or Capcom style motions, rolling this D-pad either from the bottom to the right or doing the Shoryuken move. And to me it feels like it's very easy to press these diagonals. After a couple minutes of getting oriented with its feel, I had no problems whatsoever playing Street Fighter 2 games. So this is definitely a D-pad that is Shoryukenable and Hadoukenable. And if we go back to that gamepad testing app, you can see it's very simple to press the diagonals in any direction you'd like. However, there is such a thing as diagonals being too easy, which can result in accidental diagonals when you don't want them. A simple test for this is Contra on the NES. What I do here is I press down on the D-pad and then rock it back and forth and see how much the character moves. Ideally, you want only a little bit of movement, but as you can see, this is basically all over the place. So for me, this is absolutely failing the Contra test. It is very hard to keep my character in place when rocking back and forth. And again, in that gamepad tester app, we can see this in motion, where if I rock it back and forth, it will go left and right. Now, another example of accidental movement is when using a fighting game like Killer Instinct. What I'm trying to do here is move back with my character for a couple seconds and then immediately go forward while pressing the kick button. This move is called a flick flack or a handstand kick. And as you can see here, when I try to move from front to back, what I end up doing instead is jumping with my character, basically negating that move. And so not only does it fail the Contra test, but it fails this Killer Instinct test as well. And again, you can see this manifest in the gamepad testing app. When you go from one motion to the next, you will see that the up and down buttons will also be triggered here and there. So in my assessment here, the D-pad is a little bit too soft with certain games and certain moves. Now outside of testing specific moves, I really didn't have many issues with the D-pad itself in actual gameplay. So really, I would take this with a grain of salt. It'll really depend on how sensitive you are to these accidental diagonals. However, if you've ever tried a device where you have had that as a problem, then it's probably going to be replicated here. Okay, moving on. On the bottom left, we have our select and start buttons. These have a nice soft click. And then next, let's talk about these face buttons. Now, these are very similar to other INEO devices. These also have a rubber membrane connection, and so they do have a more classic retro feel when you press down on them. The buttons themselves have a good amount of travel and feel nice and springy. My only main complaint here has been the same complaint I've had with the other INEO Air devices in that the buttons just feel a little bit too small. In addition, I wish they were just a little bit more rounded because I think it would be easier on your fingers. But again, I think these are minor complaints that don't affect the functionality of the buttons themselves. These could be a lot worse, and so in that regard, I'm going to give them a pass. And then finally, on the bottom right, we have two other buttons. The one on the right is going to function as your home button within the Android system, and then the one on the left will bring up an I and Neil quick menu, which we'll go over in the software section. Next, let's take a look at the top, starting with our shoulder and trigger buttons. And these again are very similar to other INEO devices. The shoulder buttons have a slight mushy feel to them, but they're very easy to press down on and they spring up pretty easily. And you can press down anywhere on the button and it's going to register just fine. I'm also a big fan of these triggers. These have Hall Effect and are analog in their input. And I think among all the other INEO devices in their catalog, the INEO Air ones have the best travel altogether. On top of that, they're easy to press down on and very responsive. And so I have no complaints about these triggers at all. I think they're some of the best. In the end, when it comes to ergonomics of this device, I think that everything is very functional. All the buttons are very easy to access. And no matter if you're playing with like a more analog and trigger style or with a D-pad centric function, all of those seem to work really well. In fact, when it comes to other Android based devices, the only one I can think of that's more comfortable than this is the Logitech Cloud. My only complaint with the ergonomics is that it just feels a little bit too small in the fact that I don't really have a place to put my pinkies. And a lot of that has to do with the nature of how these grips have been designed. With other devices like the Logitech Cloud, they're a bit taller, so there's enough space for your entire hand. Going back to the top here, we have an exhaust vent here on the left. And then to the right of that, we have a microphone input. Next, we have our volume buttons up and down, and then our power and sleep button, which also functions as a fingerprint sensor. And then finally, up top, hidden right next to those bumpers, are two hotkeys. I like the fact that they're discreet, but also easy to access if you want them. Now on their own, they don't have any function at all. They're not like a back or a home button. Instead, they just are their own key code. And that's actually a really good thing and something you don't really see on a lot of these other handhelds. And what this means is if you have an app that'll allow you to program your own hotkeys, you can use those instead. For example, here with the PSP emulator, I'm setting up one to be a safe state and the other to be a load state. And that's how they'll function in the game. I can tap one of them to save the state and then I'll tap on the other to load it back up. And there are quite a few apps that'll allow you to set your own hotkeys, so I think this is a really nice function. 
Next, we're going to look at the back, and while we're here, we're going to get a feel for the overall plastic texture. And this is very similar to other iNeo devices. It has a little bit of a glossy sheen to it. Now, generally with the darker devices, this means it's going to pick up on fingerprints, but because we have this off-white color right here, it didn't have any sort of issues with that at all. So it does have a slight shine to it and a bit of a slippery texture, but I think overall it's pretty good. Anyway, on the back here, other than that larger logo, we have our fan intake on the right side. Next, let's take a look at the bottom, starting with our stereo speakers on each side. And we'll start with a quick audio test at full volume. So first thing, it does get very loud. In fact, it's probably a little bit louder than you would ever need. However, I did find that the clarity of the audio itself is a little bit on the muffled side. They're certainly not the worst speakers I've heard, but Ioneo has never really nailed it in that regard. And unfortunately, the Pocket Air does follow that tradition. Now sticking with the bottom, on the left side we have our microSD card cartridge slot. And the neat thing about this is that it's two-sided. You'll put the microSD card side on one, and then if you have a SIM card, you can use that on the other. And I just so happen to have a SIM card, so let's go ahead and test out this functionality. And setting it up was super easy. All I had to do is just put it in, and then I turned off my Wi-Fi, and I immediately found my mobile network. And the connection here is 4G LTE. So this might work out great if you want to have connectivity when outside of a Wi-Fi network. For example, if you wanted to have retro achievements on the go, you could definitely do that. Now to the right of the micro SD card slot, we have our 3.5 millimeter headphone jack, and then also our single USB-C port with a microphone input here as well. Now I did test the video out capability and it worked out just fine. I used a USB-C to HDMI adapter and then plugged it into my monitor. And as far as I could tell, everything worked great. We had a 1080p 16x9 output and the audio also carried over through the HDMI. And there's a couple scenarios where this might be of benefit. Number one is if you wanted to plug this directly into a monitor while still playing on the device, you could do that with a larger screen. But bear in mind that within the settings, I couldn't find any way to turn off the screen itself. So I hope that's something they add to their software. Additionally, I tried out the iNeo Multi-Station Dock. Now, this is primarily meant for handheld PCs, but it's nice to see that it also works with this Android device. Now, another scenario you could do if you didn't want to plug it directly into the device, you could also use a Bluetooth controller. And the Bluetooth seems to work just fine. I'm not getting any input lag, at least any that I can tell. Next, I want to do a little bit of testing with the screen. The first thing you might notice are some lines rolling across the display. This is just very typical of an OLED panel. And to the naked human eye, you won't see this at all. To start, let's take a look at the minimum brightness, and it does get pretty dim. And I think this will work out pretty well in a low light environment. It's not perfect when it comes to pitch black darkness. I think that it would still be a little bit too bright, but in most other scenarios, I think it'll be fine. Now the maximum brightness does get pretty impressively bright. According to their website, it gets about 350 nits of brightness, and that does seem about right. Now the ultimate test of whether or not it's bright enough will be in an outdoor setting. And I found that while outdoors, but in the shade, yes, it is definitely bright enough to play. However, in direct sunlight, I found it to be just a little bit too dim. But to be fair, I've never really found a handheld that works really well in direct sunlight anyway. So in a nutshell, I love this display. It has really rich colors and a nice color accuracy, and also gets sufficiently dim and bright. The only complaint I have is that I wish it was just a little bit larger. And I think that's a great segue to our next topic, which is going to be a size comparison. We'll start with the Nintendo Switch Lite, because this one also has a 5.5 inch screen. And as you can see, this one's a little bit smaller than the Pocket Air. Another device with a similar screen is the Pimax Portal. This one's a little bit under 5.5 inches and has both LCD and QLED display options. Next up we have the Odin Pro, which is just a tiny bit larger than the Pocket Air. This one also has a larger screen, 6 inches, but it is LCD and not OLED. Moving up from there, we have devices with a wider aspect ratio. We're going to start with the Razer Edge. This one is 6.8 inches, but with a 20 by 9 aspect ratio, which means it's going to be quite a bit longer. Another device with a similar setup is the GPD XP Plus. This has the same resolution and aspect ratio, but the unique thing about this device is it has the exact same chipset as the Pocket Air that we're reviewing today. Now personally, I'm not a huge fan of a 20 by 9 aspect ratio on a handheld device, because to me it's too wide for both 4x3 and 16x9 content. At that point, you're very close to just slapping a controller onto a phone. Speaking of which, let's do exactly that for a size comparison. Here's the LG V60, which has a Snapdragon 865 chip inside, and has that same 20 by 9 aspect ratio, but paired here with a Backbone 1 controller. 
Next up, we have the Logitech G Cloud. This is a seven inch display, but thankfully has a 16 by nine aspect ratio. And this one is also much larger than the Pocket Air, but like I mentioned before, a lot more comfortable to hold as well. Now on the other end of the spectrum, we have smaller Android handhelds. Here is the Ambernic RG405M. This one has a four inch display, but it's a four by three aspect ratio and more well suited for retro game emulation. A similar device is the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus, the exact same chipset as the 405M, but with a 16 by nine aspect ratio display. And finally, because you might be wondering, here is the Steam Deck, and as you can see, this one dwarfs the Ioneo Pocket Air. Now, another device worth making a comparison with is the Ioneo Air 1S. This is their latest Air release when it comes to handheld PCs. And as you can see, it has the exact same panel and size as the Pocket Air. However, I was surprised to find that the Pocket Air is a lot thinner than the Air 1S. It's 17 and a quarter millimeters in the center base, which is about 20% thinner than the Air 1S. In terms of weight, we're looking at 375 grams, which is about 13 ounces. This makes it about 100 grams heavier than the Nintendo Switch Lite, but about on par with the AYN Odin. And it's also about 75 grams lighter than the Ioneo Air 1S. In general, I have no complaints about the size and portability of the Ioneo Pocket Air. I think it would have been more impressive if they had included a six inch screen with this device, but five and a half inches is still really great. Now I wouldn't consider this to be a completely pocketable device. After all, it is quite a bit bulkier than the Nintendo Switch Lite, but if you have larger pockets, you can definitely fit them in a jam. If anything, I would say this is a very portable device, something you can put in a case and then throw in a bag, but it's not quite at that level where you can just kind of take it around with you anywhere you go. Okay, next I wanna talk about the overall software experience and some of the quirks that you will find inside. To start, the home screen is very similar to basically any other Android product. It feels very much so like a tablet. In that regard, you can use Google Play Store to install your apps and then launch them directly from here. Now, Ioneo has their own front end they've been working on. It's called Aya Space. And when I first got the device and I booted it up, I was able to get into this program. And from the looks of it, they're using some sort of hybrid between both the Pegasus installer or emulation station directly into this front end. However, as I was trying to set it up, I noticed that all the language is in Chinese. And unfortunately within the settings, it was already set to English. So I wasn't able to change it back. And so naturally I did what any other reviewer would do in that I updated the software. And there's good news and bad news when the update. The good news is that it fixed the language issues, so I had no problem navigating through in English. However, the bad news is that it basically broke the IS Space app, and so I'm no longer able to actually launch it. Now, this software is still in a pre-release state, and so I'm not entirely surprised that this happened in the first place. Instead, I'll have to revisit this sometime in the future. That being said, there are quite a few things I can show off. For example, they have a handheld settings section, and within here you'll find specific tweaks that you can make for the Pocket Air. Right now it's pretty bare bones, but I would expect that they will update this as time marches on. The other software function that worked really well is the Ioneo quick button on the bottom right. This brings up a sidebar with all sorts of different configurations. On the main window, you can see things like CPU and GPU utilization. And there's also three different performance modes. We have game, balanced, and power saving. And for all my testing, I kept everything on the game setting. There's also three different fan toggles. We have mute, balanced, and max. And we'll test that here in a second. But first I wanna show the performance overlay. When you turn this on, you can drag it wherever you'd like on the screen. And this will be great if you're trying to play a certain game and you wanna see where the power is actually being consumed. Next, we're gonna test out the fan noise at the lowest level, which is basically inaudible. Next is the balance setting, which is audible, but not terribly noisy. And finally, we have the max setting, which is pretty loud, but not as loud as handheld PCs. Overall, I found that the fan noise here is perfectly acceptable from an ambient noise perspective. Now in the controller section of the sidebar, we have a couple other options. First, we can actually turn the controller off itself in case it's causing a conflict. You can also adjust the vibration sensitivity as well as the analog trigger and joystick sensitivity and range. And you can also turn on the gyroscopic controls as well as the turbo function for the face buttons. And in testing the gyroscopic controls, it seemed to work out really well. For example, with Nintendo 3DS, I got full six axis controls. So I was able to both rotate the device up and down, but then also left and right, and everything seemed to be very accurate. 
In the next section of the sidebar, we have some other handheld settings, including adjusting the brightness and volume, as well as toggling on and off the RGB lights. Now within the RGB light settings, there are a couple different presets, and these seem to be modeled after the Windows version of the ISBase app. However, unfortunately within the settings right now, there are no options to be able to reduce the brightness of the LEDs, and I found them to be just way too bright altogether. So unfortunately as it stands right now, unless they have some sort of software fix in the future, I'm probably not going to be using the LED lights at all. And honestly, I think that's kind of a shame because it's a pretty cool function if it was just a little bit less bright. And to wrap up this sidebar section, we have a widgets page, which basically has all of your Android based functions. And then also on the bottom, we have our settings options. This will allow us to update the software as well as jump into both the handheld and Android settings. Now, another thing that's missing from the current software and it's still in development is the key mapping software. This means that for games that do not support an external controller, you're going to have to play them directly on the screen. And unfortunately, this is not a great setup because you have to reach over the controls in order to touch the display. And so it kind of feels like a stretch. In fact, it's a lot more comfortable to just play these touchscreen games on an actual phone. Now, hopefully when these actually ship out as retail units, you will have that key mapping function because I think it's going to be great for certain Android games that do not have external controller support. For example, Genshin Impact on medium settings can actually run at a pretty stable 60 frames per second. You're going to get some dips here and there, especially when rotating the camera, but overall I would say this is a definitely playable experience. And I think with key mapping software, yes, this would be a game that would be a lot of fun to play on this beautiful OLED panel. Okay, now that we've wrapped our heads around the entire hardware and software experience, let's actually get into performance and game testing. We're going to start with emulation with the low-end systems and work our way up from there. When it comes to the very low-end stuff, you know, Game Boy, Game Boy Color, you're going to have absolutely zero performance issues with any of these retro systems, but I did want to make a note that the OLED panel really makes these colors pop on the screen. It's also going to be a very similar story with Game Boy Advance, and this one looks even better because it's a little bit wider of an aspect ratio. When it comes to home console retro systems, it's going to be exactly the same in the fact that there's no performance issues whatsoever, and the games themselves look especially gorgeous on this display. There are also certain Sega Genesis games that will support widescreen gameplay using the GPS Plus GX wide core. And these games are going to look great on this panel too. Moving forward, Super Nintendo is also going to look equally fine, and again, performance here will be absolutely great. Same thing with arcade games, all your 80s and 90s classics will work out just fine. And some of the more heavyweight arcade games like Killer Instinct will also play at full speed. Now moving on from here, we're going to test the 3D based systems, those that we can upscale to a higher resolution. We're going to start with PlayStation 1 at a 5x resolution, which is essentially a 1080p. And all these games will also play at full speed, even with this upscale. So if you're looking to play high resolution PlayStation 1 games, this will be just great. It's a similar story with Nintendo 64, again upscaled to a 1080p resolution, and all these games are playing full speed. The only game I got a tiny hint of slowdown with was 007 Goldeneye, but otherwise I would find this to be a perfect experience. And if you prefer to have very smooth gameplay over nice graphics, you can always reduce the upscaled resolution in this particular game. Moving on from there, we have Sega Dreamcast. Now this one will not upscale to a perfect 1080p, but thankfully the next highest one, which is 1440p, still plays at full speed with every single game that I tested. In addition, the Redream app has the ability to use widescreen cheats, which will fill out the entire screen. Even the hardest Dreamcast game that I have in my catalog to emulate, which is NBA 2K2, played absolutely no problem. Switching back over to handheld systems, let's talk about Nintendo DS. This one can play two screens side by side, or you can also use a hotkey to be able to toggle between having a main screen. And in that regard, it works out just fine. We're using a high resolution display property, which means that it's going to be a slight upscale of a 2x resolution. And because we have a touchscreen display, you can also play touchscreen based games like Phoenix Wright. And the accuracy of the touchscreen is very good as well, so absolutely no problems right here playing even something a little bit more intense like Trauma Center Under the Knife. The next handheld system is the Sony PlayStation Portable. This one I played most games at a 4x resolution or 1080p. And again, for the most part, every single one of these games played at 100% full speed with no dips whatsoever. However, I did find that one game in particular did require me to bump down that resolution to 720p or a 3x upscale, and that was God of War Chains of Olympus. And in all fairness, at 1080p it actually got about 95% speed, so it was very close. So if anything, I would say that for the vast majority of the PSP games, yes, you can set it to a 1080p resolution, and you will have a couple exceptions here and there. The final handheld system is Nintendo 3DS. For this one, I'm using the most recent Canary Citra build. And this app now has official Vulkan support, so that's what I used in my graphic backend. 
and I was happy to report here that most games are playable at a 3x resolution upscale. You're definitely going to get some stutters early in each of these games as the shaders compile, but after they've all been cached, you will have a much smoother gameplay experience. So I'm pretty confident in saying that this is a 3DS capable handheld device. Some games you will have to drop down the resolution, and you might still get a stutter here and there just by virtue of this emulator, but overall I would say the entire catalog is going to be playable with some minor tweaks here and there. Now unfortunately, the Nintendo 3DS is the last system that I can comfortably say is entirely playable on the Pocket Air. So let's tackle these other systems, starting with the Sega Saturn first. Now I found that the Yabasan Shiro Core within Retroarch provided me with the best gameplay experience. I would say about three quarters of the catalog played at full speed at the native resolution. However, I found there were quite a few games that had some problems. Die Hard Arcade is a great example here, with that same Yamasan Shiro core, we're getting all sorts of graphical glitches. Now, Retrowork has two other cores available for Sega Saturn gameplay. The first is my favorite, it's called the Beetle Saturn core. And this emulator is very accurate, but unfortunately it has high power demands. And for this chipset in particular, it's just too much for it to handle, so this game will not play at full speed. And unfortunately, it's the same problem with the other core, which again runs at about a half speed. Now, generally I would turn to the standalone Yabasan Shiro core, but unfortunately with this particular chipset, I have found that the optimization and compatibility is not very good. Here in the OpenGL backend, you can see that none of these sprites are actually loading, and if you try to load the game with the Vulkan backend, you're just going to get a black screen. And so unfortunately, we're kind of at a dead end when it comes to playing a game like Die Hard Arcade. And you'll find it's going to be a similar scenario with the other 25% of games that are on the Sega Saturn. With Virtua Fighter 2, we're not getting at quite full speed with the Yabasan Shiro Core, but then we're having these same display issues with the standalone emulator. OpenGL only loads the background, and we're getting just a black screen with the Vulkan backend. So when it comes down to it, yes, about three quarters of the Saturn catalog will be playable, but if you're looking for a specific Sega Saturn emulating machine, I don't think this is going to be a good fit. Now I think the main consoles that people are most interested in testing out are Nintendo GameCube and PlayStation 2. And the way I see it, if I'm going to pay $300 for a dedicated Android handheld, I expect it to play the full GameCube and PS2 catalogs at an upscale with very minor tweaking. And unfortunately with GameCube, I got some mixed results. To start, there are some games that will play at a full 1080p or 3x resolution. However, those are relatively few and far between. Instead, I found that a 2x resolution gave me the most consistent results. However, much like with the Sega Saturn emulator, I found that the graphics backend really made a big difference with certain games. And unfortunately, the Vulkan backend, which is generally more performant, was the one that had the most graphical issues. And in some games, the graphical glitches were relatively minor. It's really going to be up to you whether or not you find this to be acceptable. For me personally, I don't. And so in those cases, I would have to switch over to the OpenGL backend, which sadly is not quite as performant. For example, here with Metal Gear Solid Twin Snakes, at a 2x resolution, I got quite a bit of slowdown in the open areas. I would say it's not enough for me to drop it down to a 1x resolution, but it was definitely something I noticed. For other games like Resident Evil 4, the Vulcan backend was completely unplayable. Thankfully, the OpenGL backend was still pretty performant at a 2x resolution. So this is a game I would be 100% comfortable playing through at these settings here. Another game that didn't have full graphics in the Vulcan backend was Metroid Prime. And unfortunately, this one also would have some slowdown at a 2x resolution. Now, it's not all doom and gloom. There are many games that will play with the Vulcan backend and at a full speed at a 2x resolution. So I would say the vast majority of GameCube games are playable even at a 2x resolution, but you will have to swap between the graphics backend depending on that game. However, there are still some games at the very top tier that will not play at full speed. For example, here's F-Zero GX. I'm using the latest dev version of the official Dolphin, but at a native resolution and with a Vulkan backend, we're very rarely getting up to a full 60 frames per second. Now here I'm also using the VBI skip hack, which will reduce some of the stuttering that comes with the slowdown, but all the same, I feel like F-Zero GX players are really going to want to play it at a full speed. And in those cases, you'll probably have to make some compromises. For example, you may have to use the Dolphin MMJR build. This is a fork of the official Dolphin that has some concessions when it comes to graphical accuracy, but it will improve performance with certain games, including F-Zero GX. 
So when it comes down to it, unfortunately, GameCube is not going to be a plug and play adventure. You will have to mess around with the graphics settings here and there, and in a worst case scenario, you may have to try different dolphin forks. In the end, I'm not 100% comfortable saying that yes, every GameCube game is going to play just fine. Instead, I would say you have to get comfortable with the settings in order to make sure that every game is going to be playable. Next up we have Nintendo Wii, and for this one I didn't even bother with a 2x resolution because every game I tried did have slowdown. Instead I found that a native resolution with the Vulcan backend seemed to work surprisingly well with most of these games. Even the harder to emulate games like Super Mario Galaxy and Tatsunoko vs Capcom played at full speed at a native resolution. You would get some stuttering here and there as the shaders cached, much like with the 3DS emulator, but I found it all to be perfectly acceptable. Okay, and next up we have PlayStation 2, and unfortunately the results here were somewhat mixed again. Thankfully for the vast majority of them, the Vulcan backend worked just fine, and many games would play at a 2x resolution at full speed. In fact, even God of War 2 played at a 2x resolution with the Vulcan backend with minimal slowdown. So the way I see it, about 90% of PS2 games are going to play just fine, even upscaled to a 2x resolution. In fact, the performance here is quite a bit better than I found on average with Nintendo GameCube. However, there are a couple things to bear in mind with this PS2 emulator in particular. Number one, the developer abandoned this project, so we're not going to see any updates in the future. So it kind of turns into a what you see is what you get when it comes to performance specifically with PS2. And sadly, there are still some games that are not optimized very well with the Aether SX2 emulator. For example, Shadow of the Colossus had to be dropped down to a native resolution, and I also had to turn on a mild underclock just to get something close to full speed. So unfortunately, I would say this is a slightly compromised experience when it comes to PS2 emulation. And unfortunately, it does get worse with certain games. For example, with Dragon Quest VIII, I used the same settings with a native resolution and mild underclock, but even then the game played at about three quarters speed. And personally, I find that adding any additional hacks to this game will compromise that experience just a little too much. The way I see it, I've been waiting for PlayStation 2 emulation for so long that I don't want to compromise it when I finally get it. The other aspect to consider is that emulation optimization is usually focused on Snapdragon chipsets because those are the most prominent. So we're going to go back to that Snapdragon 865 versus Dimensity D1200 comparison that we showed off in the beginning of the video. And like I mentioned then, the performance benchmarks here are basically neck and neck. However, when it comes to emulation on Android, optimizations for chipset really reign supreme. So let's take a look at a Snapdragon 865 performance in emulation compared to the Ioneo Pocket Air. And here's my LG V60 phone. This one has the same 8GB of RAM, but it's running a Snapdragon 865. And as you can see, it's running at full speed. There's a couple dips here and there in the beginning of the game, but nothing I would consider to be game breaking. And I think this is a great example where raw performance doesn't mean everything when it comes to high-end emulation. In fact, optimization is probably the most important aspect overall. And sadly, because PS2 emulation on Android has halted, it is very unlikely that we're going to see any sort of improvement with the Pocket Air in the future. Okay, and the final emulated system is going to be Nintendo Switch. Now, as expected, the very lightweight and 2D games are going to run just fine on this chipset. After all, many of these games run just fine on much less powerful Android devices. When you start getting into the more 3D intensive games, you will see a lot of slowdown. For example, with Entitled Goose Game, I got an average of about 40 frames per second. Other games would slow to an absolute crawl. Hades is a great example here, where it runs at about 15 frames per second, completely unplayable. And for each of these games, I tried both of the two prominent Android emulators, both Yuzu and Skyline. It's a similar story with Cuphead. This one has a bunch of stops and stutters to the point where it makes it unplayable for me. I also tried a couple heavyweight games like Super Mario 3D World, and I found that on the Pocket Air, these were absolutely unplayable as well. I got an average of about 15 frames per second, so about 25% speed. And again, this is after trying both emulator options as well as tweaking the settings. Now, having additional RAM might improve some Nintendo Switch gameplay, but I don't think that it's the RAM that's holding it back. Instead, I think it's optimizations for this particular chipset because, again, the developers focus mostly on Snapdragon chips. Now let's go back to the LG V60 with the Snapdragon 865 processor. I've loaded up some custom graphics drivers, and as you can see here, Super Mario 3D World is completely playable. It would still get some slowdowns here and there, but all the same, this is a night and day difference between the Pocket Air and this one. 
It's a similar story with the other games too. For example, with Hades, I got an average of about 30 frames per second, so about double the speed that I was getting on the Pocket Air, and Cuphead itself was fully playable. Now, Switch emulation development might get to the point where it does support the Dimensity D1200 chipset, but unless we get some significant upgrades to the MediaTek graphics drivers, I'm not really expecting much. Okay, so that's it for emulation. Now let's talk about Android gaming. I'm not a huge Android gamer in the first place, but all the same, I did test out a bunch of games. And honestly, the performance here was basically at the point that everything I threw at it played just fine. Really, when it comes down to testing Android-based devices, my biggest concern is always whether or not the controls themselves get coded correctly. And it appears that within the Pocket Air, they did everything right. So with every single game that supported controls, this one worked just fine. In the end, in terms of just dedicated Android gaming, I actually found this to be a really great experience. We have a nice OLED panel, a 16 by 9 aspect ratio. And like I mentioned before, the controls work out just great. And so no matter what, if you are planning on playing Android games on this device, I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. And finally, the last game testing that I did was with streaming. After all, this has Wi-Fi 6, so the connection here should be very stable. And there are a couple things to note about streaming on this device. Number one, I live in Hawaii, which means that cloud streaming is basically terrible. You have to remember that there are 2,000 miles of ocean between us and the US mainland. So when it came to Xbox Game Pass cloud streaming, yeah, I was getting a lot of stutters here and there, but I think this has to do more with my location than the device itself. The other thing worth noting is that if you want to stream a more modern game, something with more analog stick and trigger controls, it's going to be a great experience on this device. This is often something that will hold back a lot of Android devices, but I will tell you right now, this is a really great and comfortable feeling to play modern games on the Pocket Air. So overall, if you're looking to do game streaming on this device, I think you'll have a great time. And finally, because this is an Android-based device, you have the entire Google Play Store at your fingertips. This means that you can do things like play YouTube videos from your favorite content creator, or you could also stream movies from Netflix and Disney Plus or your own Plex server. In addition, you can do all the other things that an Android tablet could do, including productivity things like checking your email. And if you consider using an LTE SIM card, you can get a lot of functionality out of this device that is not specifically meant for gaming. All right, this is a really long video. I hope you've had a snack and drink to help get you through. And let's go ahead and start wrapping up by talking about what I like and what I don't like about the Pocket Air. As always, we're going to start with what I like, and number one are the controls. INEO has spent a lot of time working on this form factor, and I think it really shows in the Pocket Air. I also found this to be a fairly ergonomic device. It's not quite perfect and not the best Android handheld I've ever used, but it is very close to the top. I also found that it's a lightweight device, especially when compared to similarly sized handheld PCs. The battery life here is also excellent. I would expect an average of eight hours of gameplay, depending on what you're playing and what fan speed you're using. I'm also a big fan of this AMOLED display. It is only five and a half inches. I wish it was six, but all the same, the colors are great and it gets sufficiently dim and bright. Finally, I also like the fact that we have an LTE option. I don't personally plan on using it, but I think that there are others out there that do. And I always appreciate it when there is added functionality to an Android based device. Now, of course, the Pocket Air is not perfect, so let's talk about some of the things I don't like about it. Number one is a very temporary thing, but I do not like the state of the current software. It's a bummer that I wasn't able to even test the ISpace app because it crashed on me with the latest version. In addition, this device really needs key mapping software if you plan on playing Android games. I'm also pretty disappointed with the diagonals on the D-pad. The other iNeo Air devices also have pretty loose diagonals, but those are more focused on playing PC games. On an Android-based device like this, which is probably going to be focused more on retro game emulation, it is disappointing. However, my biggest disappointment by far was the GameCube and PlayStation 2 performance on this device. Like I said during that section, if I'm going to pay $300 for a handheld device, I fully expect it to be able to play every GameCube and PS2 game with minimal setting tweaks. And on paper, it looks like this device should play those systems no problem, but unfortunately the reality is just not the same. For those two systems in particular, I spent more time fiddling with the settings than actually playing games, which for me is a very bad sign. So if you are looking for a device that is pick up and play GameCube and PS2, I don't think this is going to be a very good fit. When it comes down to it, I think this device has great hardware, but it's all built around the wrong chip. Unfortunately, the Dimensity D1200 leaves a lot to be desired, especially when it comes to emulation development. It may come to pass that in the future, some of these apps will get better optimized, but at least as it stands right now, the performance for me was underwhelming. So in the end, you're probably wondering whether or not I recommend the iNeo Pocket Air. 
And I think the answer here is fairly subjective and also nuanced. So to start, I want to go back to the price point. As a reminder here, for $299 at the Indiegogo price, we can get that base model. And from an emulation standpoint, I think that 6 gigabytes is going to be just fine. Now, if we do straight comparisons against other devices, this is actually not a bad price. For example, the GPD XB Plus has been out for over a year now, and it's not even available through GPD. At this point, you have to buy it through a third-party retailer, and the lowest price you're going to find is about 400 bucks. And remember, this is the same exact chip as the Pocket Air, but with a worse screen and worse controls. Up next, let's take a look at the Razer Edge. This one comes in at $400 as well, but if you want that LTE option, it's an additional $200, rounding out to $600 altogether. Now, this chip is a Snapdragon, and the performance here is going to be quite a bit better. But all the same, like I said in my Razer Edge review, I don't think that this is going to be worth it when you compare it to something like the Steam Deck. Now, on the other hand, there are cheaper devices out there, like the AYN Odin Pro. This one has an overclocked Snapdragon 845. It's not going to have the same raw performance power as the Dimensity 1200. But because of those optimizations for the Snapdragon chipset, the performance is actually pretty similar between the Odin Pro and the Pocket Air. However, I would say that the emulation performance is slightly better on the Pocket Air over the Odin Pro. Next up is the Pimax Portal. This one has four different SKUs, but I'm going to be looking at the most low tier model starting at $299. This one has an LCD panel, but 8GB of RAM and a 1440p display. It also has the Snapdragon XR2, which is the equivalent of a Snapdragon 865. But there are two main drawbacks with this device. Number one are the actual controls. The D-pad itself is not very comfortable to use. And this only has a 4000 mAh battery, which is going to give you about half the battery life as the Pocket Air. And finally, the other Android device that's out right now that's worth comparing within the same price or chipset is the Logitech G Cloud. Now this one is by far the least powerful of the other devices that we've looked at. In fact, this one struggles to play GameCube and PS2 at all. Additionally, this one is way overpriced. I think the best fit would be between two and $250. So when it comes down to it, between that three and $320 price point, I do think that the Pocket Air is competitively priced. In fact, among all the other devices that we just looked at at this price point, I think the Pocket Air is probably your best bang for your buck. And so in a vacuum, despite the issues I have with performance on specific emulators, I still think the Pocket Air is actually a relatively good price at around $300. However, as you probably know, the tech world does not exist in a vacuum. And there are other devices that are coming out in the future worth your consideration. The first one that was announced is the AYN Odin 2. And this one's using a very powerful Snapdragon 8 Gen 2 CPU. It also comes with three different RAM and storage options, with the starting price being under $300. And so, barring any delays with the fulfillments, if you're willing to wait until December for the Odin 2, you're going to get a device that's significantly more powerful than the Pocket Air for around the same price. So the way I see it, in about three months, the Pocket Air could potentially be irrelevant compared to something like the Odin 2. And probably the most telling sign regarding the relevancy of the Pocket Air comes from INEO themselves. Shortly after the Odin 2 was released, they had their own announcement to make. And that is that they're working on a new device called the INEO Pocket S. This one is running the upcoming Snapdragon G3X Gen 2 chipset. And so performance here should also be significantly better than the Pocket Air. However, bear in mind that as of right now, the Pocket S has only been announced. There is no timetable for when this will be actually released. All the same, the fact that INEO made this announcement while their other device is up for pre-order says a lot to me. So in summary, here's the way I see it. Yes, on its own, the INEO Pocket Air is a pretty darn good device for the price. It has a wonderful display and excellent controls and a big battery. But unfortunately, when it comes to emulation, it is being held back by that Dimensity chip. I know a lot of people, myself included, were really looking forward to a GameCube and PS2-centric device in the Pocket Air. And for the most part, yes, they got very close to actually achieving that goal. But for my part, I found that I spent way too much time in the settings for my own comfort. So in the end, if you don't mind fiddling around with settings and trying to squeeze out the best performance you can, you will probably have a lot of fun with the Pocket Air. But for anybody else who's looking for a more plug-and-play Android experience, then I don't think this is the one to get, and we should probably wait for something better down the line. Anyway, let me know what you think in the comments down below. Is the Pocket Air the device for you, or are you just surprised like I am that INEO finally released a device at $299? As always, thank you for watching this very long video, and be sure to like and subscribe if you found it helpful, and we will see you next time. Happy gaming.